In our last presentation, we looked at the zero input response of a linear system governed by an ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. We found the general solution for this problem, and it was in terms of characteristic modes. Each of these characteristic modes was associated with a distinct characteristic value, a root of q of lambda equals zero. In this presentation, we're going to discuss some special cases. The first of which is where the lambdas are distinct, but are complex valued rather than real valued. The first thing to point out is that this case really isn't any different than the one we studied earlier. As long as the roots are distinct, the solution will be the same as we found before. However, in the case that the roots are complex, we can come up with alternative ways of expressing our solution. Now the coefficients of our characteristic polynomial q of lambda will be real valued. These coefficients come from the differential equation. And if the coefficients a1 through an are real valued, then we know that the roots of the characteristic polynomial must occur in complex conjugate pairs. That is, if one root is given as lambda 1 equals alpha plus j beta, where j is the square root of minus 1, then there must be another root that's given as alpha minus j beta. This situation can be illustrated graphically as seen here. Lambda 1 is given by alpha plus j beta, that is, its real value is alpha and its imaginary value is beta. Lambda 2 is given by alpha minus j beta. Its real value again is alpha, but now the imaginary value is negative, minus beta. So lambda 1 and lambda 2 appear as mirror images of each other in the complex plane, mirror images about the real axis. The modes associated with these two values will be y0 sub 1 equals c1 e to the lambda 1t, where lambda 1 is alpha plus j beta, and y0 2 equals c2 e to the lambda 2t, where lambda 2 is alpha minus j beta. Recall that the solution y0 has to be the sum of these two modes. For the zero input response y0 to be real valued, the coefficients of c1 and c2 must occur as a complex conjugate pair also. Otherwise, y0 of t would have an imaginary component. So what does it mean for c1 and c2 to be complex conjugate pair? It means the same as before, except now it's the coefficients. That is, one coefficient is the mirror image of the other in the complex plane. We can express this in polar notation. We can write c1 equals c over 2 e to the j theta, and c2 equals c over 2 e to the minus j theta. So now we'll take c1 and c2 in the polar form given, and we'll multiply them by e to the lambda 1t and e to the lambda 2t, and add them together. That makes y0 1 of t plus y0 2 of t. We can now simplify this using Euler's formula, and write it as y0 1 of t plus y0 2 of t equals c e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus theta. c and theta are from c1 and c2. Recall that the magnitude of c1 was c over 2, and the magnitude of c2 was c over 2. The angle of c1 was theta, and the angle of c2 was minus theta. So there's a relationship between c1 and c2 and c and theta. The alpha and beta come from lambda 1 and lambda 2. There are the real and imaginary parts of lambda 1 and lambda 2. So what have we done? All we've done is written the sum of the modes c1 e to lambda 1t plus c2 e to lambda 2t in a different form. We now express it as c e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus theta, where c and theta are taking the place of the coefficients c1 and c2, and alpha and beta are taking the place of lambda 1 and lambda 2. So in reality, this is just the same as we had before. 
just a different form of writing the general solution. So we can write either y01 of t plus y02 of t equals c1 e to lambda 1t plus c2 e to lambda 2t, or we can choose to write y01 of t plus y02 of t equals c e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus theta. These two forms are equivalent. And we should note that the first of them is no different than the case we had before when lambda 1 and lambda 2 are real. So the complex distinct characteristic value case is really not any different than what we studied in our last lecture. So what is the general solution for the zero input response in the case that all of the characteristic values are distinct? We'll write it two different ways. In the first way, we'll make no distinction on whether the characteristic values are real or complex, and we'll write the general solution as y0 of t equals c1 e to lambda 1t plus c2 e lambda 2t plus and so on through cn e to lambda nt. The second way of writing the general solution is to make a distinction based upon whether the characteristic values are real or complex. We'll separate these out and we'll remember that the complex lambda i's must occur in complex conjugate pairs. We'll put these first and we'll write c e to the alpha t plus cosine beta t plus theta for the complex modes. All the real modes will be the same as before. We write c3 e to lambda 3t through cn e to lambda nt for these real modes. These added together make up the characteristic solution in the second form. We can plot these characteristic roots lambda 1 through lambda n in the complex plane. Note that all the roots are distinct and that lambda 1 and lambda 2 appear as a complex conjugate pair. These characteristic roots are clearly very important to the solution to the zero input problem, but as it turns out, they're very important also to the case where there is an input. The characteristic roots are also known as eigenvalues, and you might see that term in other classes. So far throughout this discussion, we have assumed that all the characteristic values are distinct. Now we turn to the case where some of the characteristic values are not distinct. How will this affect the solution that we find? So now let's look at the case of repeated characteristic roots. Let's suppose the characteristic polynomial q of lambda equals zero has roots lambda one, lambda two, through lambda n, and that the first r of these are not distinct. These are repeated roots. So we'll say lambda one equals lambda two equals lambda three all the way to lambda r. Now all the other roots are distinct, lambda r plus one through lambda n. And we'll now suppose also that lambda one, lambda two, all the way through lambda n are real valued roots. So now we ask the question, what are the modes associated with these repeated roots? How are they different than the case of distinct roots? So what are the solutions associated with these real repeated roots? Recall that root lambda one has been repeated r times. The solutions are y0 1 of t equals c1 e to the lambda 1 t, y0 2 t equals c2 t e to the lambda 1 t, and so on through y0 r of t equals cr t to the r minus 1 e to the lambda 1 t. This gives us r modes. The coefficients c1, c2 through cr are again determined by initial conditions. The solutions for the distinct roots will be the same as before, so we can write the general solution to the zero input problem as follows. y0 of t will be the sum of two terms. One term is associated with all the repeated roots, the other is associated with the distinct roots. The one with the distinct roots is the same as before. We'll have c sub r plus 1 e to the lambda r plus 1 t through cn e to the lambda nt. 
associated with the real repeated roots is the term in the curly brackets multiplied by e to the lambda 1t. Inside the curly brackets, of course, you see a polynomial with coefficients c1 through cr and powers of t from t to the 0 to t to the r minus 1. Now, if a particular problem had two different sets of repeated roots, then we would get two terms similar to the one in the curly bracket. To finish our discussion, we'll look at the case where we have complex repeated roots. So let's suppose we have a set of complex conjugate roots that are repeated r times. So lambda 1 through lambda r will be alpha plus j beta, where j is the square root of minus 1. And alpha r plus 1 through alpha 2r will be equal to alpha minus j beta. Now, of course, the roots must always appear in complex conjugate pairs because the coefficients of the differential equation are real valued. We'll suppose that all the other characteristic values, lambda 2r plus 1 through lambda n, are distinct, and so the modes associated with those will be the same as before. There will be two r modes associated with the two r roots, lambda 1, lambda 2, through lambda 2r. These modes are listed at the bottom of the page. Each of these modes contains a term e to the alpha t and a term cosine beta t. Recall that alpha is the real part of the characteristic value that is repeated, and beta is the imaginary part of the characteristic value. The difference between the various modes has to do with the powers of t associated with each. We have t to the 0 through t to the r minus 1. And of course, they're different depending upon the coefficients, the ci's, and the angles, theta i's, associated with each. Of course, these are determined by the initial conditions to the problem. Once again, it's time for a pop quiz. And the question is, true or false, a linear system can have modes y0 sub 1 of t equals c1, y0 2 of t equals c2 times t. Can a linear system have these modes? Have your answer? This one's a little bit tricky. So is it true or false? A linear system can have modes C1 and C2T. The answer is true. Those modes certainly don't seem like the ones we've seen before. After all, they don't have an e to the lambda t in them. But these modes will occur if the characteristic polynomial has repeated roots at 0. That is, if lambda is 0, the e to the lambda t will be 1. One example of a system that will have these modes is d squared y of t equals x of t. That is, second derivative of y equals the input x.